<laughs> and if you look at my sporran here, now it um, isn't like the modern sporrans you'll see. They're very fancy things used for carrying money and car keys and plastic cards. Well, we had none of these. Sporrans were simple leather pouches used for carrying oatmeal. Oatmeal was a staple diet of the day. If you were up on the hills, a handful of oatmeal mixed with some water from a stream, and that might be your meal for the day. But if a word of warning, well, I have it for Colin since he's the only guy here. <laughs> a word of warning for Colin about wearing a spot. If you're going into a Highland charge and you've removed your plaid, the spot is worn on the hip. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the lassie needs a heavy spore and full of oatmeal bouncing up and down in front of you <laughs> as you're charging down the hill. So be very careful how you wear your spore. Now, Did you write that down, Colin? <laughs> now, I've got a few weapons here. This is my Highland shield or targe. Targe is from an old French word. It means target. And well, you can see why it was called that. But it's more than just a shield, it's also a weapon. I have a nice spike, it fits in the front here. I also hold my wow. dirk or my dagger in the same hand, and of course, my broadsword is in my right hand. So we were a formidable fighting force. Indeed, the British army of the day didn't know how to fight against us. Like most of the modern European armies of that time, they would stand shoulder to shoulder in long lines, firing their muskets at each other. Well, we didn't like that. We liked to get in close and mix it. So we would charge screaming into them. They might get one shot off with their muskets, but we would use an old Highland trick. We duck. <laughs> Most of the shot went right over our heads, we were back on our feet and directly into their ranks. By the time we hit them well, they were still trying to load the second musket ball into their muskets. So no wonder they dropped them and just ran away. And this sword, now it's not to be mistaken for the great claymore. This is a basket hilted broadsword. The basket hilt protects my fist, but in close combat you can punch with it as well. And these ears, or lags as we call them, they were used for trapping your enemy's sword. Slide their sword right down to the base and twist, you would take it out of their hand. Indeed, if they had a weakened blade, you could probably break the blade. So, it's a very effective fighting sword. In fact, it's so effective, I think I'll put it away now before I do myself a damage. And this one as well. Now, I've got one more weapon to show you here, but before I do that, I'll have a quick drink of water. I was out on the moors quite late last night. I've got a terrible thirst. That's better. Now, this, this wasn't really a weapon of the Highlanders. This was the main weapon of the British Army at the time. I got mine when a red coat dropped it and he ran away. It's called a Brown Bess flintlock musket. 0.75 caliber, smooth bore, weighs about 12 pound, made from African walnut and steel. It is a most unreliable and inaccurate weapon, and let me explain why. First of all, to fire it, you need one of these. And find it among my oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> There we are, found it. This is a wax paper cartridge. The wax paper contains gunpowder and a lead shot. The wax paper, of course, is to keep the powder dry. I don't know how long you've been in the Highlands, but we have a hell of a time keeping anything dry, <laughs> let alone black gunpowder. So the first thing you do is bite off the end with the powder and pour it into the barrel. Bite off the end with the leg ball. Don't hold it in your hand. You'll drop it. Keep it in your mouth and spit it into the barrel. 
You also put the wax paper in as well. Helps to act as wadding. Now, we're still not ready to fire it. Jeez. You take out your ramrod. Now, always hold your ramrod with the tips of two fingers, not with your entire hand. This is made from steel, as is the barrel. And there's gunpowder down there. The slightest spark would blow your hand off. Better to lose the tips of two fingers than your entire hand. So, ram home as hard as you can. Always put this back in its place. If you lose this, well, you just can't fire the musket again. What I've done is I've compacted the powder, held the lead ball in place. Now, if I, if I hadn't done that and I stood up like this, well, the ball just runs out the end. Makes you look a bit foolish. <laughs> now, there's um, three main parts to the firing mechanism. There's a flint lock, a flash pan, and a grate. You take a little bit of powder and you put it into the flash pan. Not too much. You put too much powder in here, you'll blow this out with your head off. <laughs> Pull back the grate so it's covering the powder. It's got a rough surface and there's a piece of flint in the jaws of the flint lock. So when I pull the trigger, the flint sparks against the grate, igniting the powder here in the flash pan. There's a tiny hole right through to the main barrel, and if you're lucky, it ignites the powder here, and it fires. I say, if you're lucky, because depending on the weather and the condition of your weapon, these things would fire less than 50% of the time. But but the men weren't foolish. The men would load it before they went into battle. They would put it on what was called safety, or half-cocked. Well, the problem with safety was it wasn't very safe. If you um, stood in a hole or banged against a tree, it would go off, killing the man standing next to you. Indeed, indeed, that was where the saying, going off half-cocked, first came from. And there's a whole lot of sayings in the English language, some of them still in use today. You can trace right back to the brown base. Keep your powder dry. <coughs> bite the bullet. Mm -hmm. Stiff as a ramrod. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that one again. Stiff as a ramrod. Ramrod straight. Lock, stock and barrel. And flash in the pan. All of these things can be traced right back to the brown base. Take, take a flash in the pan. We all know what we mean if we call someone a bit of a flash in the pan. Well, if I don't, if I don't clean this hole out every second or third shot, it becomes blocked. And when I fire the musket, I get a great big flash in the pan, but it won't fire. And of course, I, I wouldn't know it didn't fire no. because so many other men were firing at the same time. So what would I do if I had time? I'd put some more powder right. and another lead shot in. And this time, if I did clean out the hole with so much powder in the barrel, the odds are it would explode in my face, killing me and the man standing next to me. <laughs> so it wasn't a very reliable weapon. I also said it wasn't a very accurate weapon. <coughs> The book states that I'm supposed to hit something at a hundred paces. Well, believe me, it would have to be a pretty big something. <laughs> it's, it's meant for mass volley fire. Row after row of men, standing shoulder to shoulder, firing at row after row of men, also standing shoulder to shoulder. Well, the odds are you'll hit someone. <laughs> indeed, indeed, the way most of the men fired it was this. You point it in the general direction of the enemy, turn your head away, close your eyes, it makes no difference, and fire, hoping you might hit someone. Now, some men would try a bit harder. They held it right up here trying to aim it, but when they fired, the powder flash would burn the sides of their faces, even the faces of the men standing next to them. So, so these men were were permitted to grow facial hair, protecting the sides of their faces from the powder burns of the brown bess. And they called that facial hair... Sideburns. 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 And that's where the name sideburns comes from, protecting the sides of the men's faces from the powder burns of the brown bess. Now, I didn't bring my bayonets along with me tonight. You'd probably be quite pleased. But there were two different bayonets used. The first